Come on, baby. Good life, good life, good life. Good morning, everyone. Good Hello, morning. Eva. Hey, do you like my green screen effect? That looks yes. good. That looks very elegant. Actually, we're live, we're live. Wow, okay. Actually, this is a photograph of an office that I use in the city near us to run online workshops. <clears throat> All right. And no, I'm not using a green screen. Isn't that interesting, right? It's very nice. You don't have, I'm using, I, I'm using a green screen effect without the green screen. I tried the green screen. I couldn't make the darn thing work properly. Anyway, nice to see you, John. Nice to see you, Anna. And nice to see you, Yvonne, as well. Okay. Thank you. We are live and we're going to talk about telling a story that shares something that you really value, right? And this is the second last one for the year. Next week is the last one. And then I want to have a break until the new year, if that's okay with everybody, all right? Sure. Um, I'll still put content in the group for us, but I'll, I'll, I'll reserve these Friday Zooms until um, the new year. I just... Admit. Well, sir, since you're, idea. since you're running the show, I guess you get to control the days it's on. <laughs> well, no, that's not the right I way. I think that's a good that. idea. I think uh, that's a good idea because people are going to get busy. So. Yeah. Actually, to be honest with you, I really would like to have between Christmas and New Year with my family. Okay. I just want to stop. I've been working at a close. My goodness gracious me. Okay. I just want to stop. Uh, my, our daughters are going to be home, and and it's a pretty special time for me. So, I, I'm looking forward to that bit. Anyway, nice. enough of that. Sandy, welcome. Hello, nice to see you. Uh, yeah. How how's my audio? You can hear me. Yes. Yes, I That's can. Clear. And I and just you haven't even checking. made a comment about my green screen effect yet. <laughs> last Bye. week, last week you kept me into action. <laughs> and I was, I was just sharing with the others, you can actually use a green screen effect without actually physically having a green screen. Oh, no, that's true. Yeah. It's very so, true. So that's what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> oh, anyway. you're, you're such a, you're a Sharpie. There's no doubt about that. I'm not sure about how sharp I am, mate. <laughs> anyway, let's. Let's get started. Um, what I'd like to do, hi Penny, nice to see you. And if Wade's there with you, say hello to Wade for me. I hope he's feeling a little bit better. Give him a hug for me, okay? Um, we're talking about telling a story that shares something that you really value. And with your permission, I'd also like to share one with you as well. It's a story that was given to me many, many years ago, okay? It's not my story. The guy who gave it to me is not his story either. I don't know where it came from. But it's pretty emotional, and I would like to share it with you because it's, it's got an interesting thing about it. Anyway, that's later. John, you were first cab off the rank, my man, and you have a maximum, right, maximum five minutes to share a story or tell a story that shares something about a value that's important to you. Five minutes. That's three hundred seconds, Mr. Allen. All right. There you go. One one of the things that uh, my dad, who was my hero, taught me when I was in uh, mid level and then upper level management, he would to me was the ultimate person for dealing with employees and other people. And I was having a challenge with a couple of employees, and I couldn't figure out how to handle it. So I called my dad and I said what would you do in this case now? Both of these guys had uh, broken a couple laws and a few other things. So I said, how would you handle it? He said, well, the best thing to do is you call these people in and you say to them, if you were in my shoes, how would you handle it? You let them give you the answer. If you think it's too harsh, you say, well, you know, that 
that might be true, but let's do it this way. And you can come across and be the good guy with a little less punishment or whatever you want to call it. So that worked really good in that case. And then when I was the provincial manager for guard of security, the largest physical security company in the world, I had a gentleman that, again, had royally screwed up. So I called him into the office and I said to him, what would you do if you were sitting in my shoes? Looked at me with a straight face and said, I'd fire me. Looked at him and I said, your wish has just been granted. Hmm. He's walked out and he said to my uh, scheduler outside the door, outside my office, he said, I think I just fired myself. <laughs> Guy looked at him, Brent was his name, looked at him and he said, you did. But the whole thing to me was what that taught me was you can have different levels of compassion depending on what the situation involves. And usually the person will come up with a lot harsher uh, penalties or whatever you want to call it than you will. So it was a great lesson to learn of how you can deal with people. That's Absolutely. my story. John, I mean, compassion is the ultimate word. Um, it's something that many entrepreneurs forget about, to be quite frank with you. Okay. But it is an extremely important part of our life and the way we build relationships and the way we deal with, but more importantly, how we treat people. And I think that's a great story. Thank you very much for sharing, John. You're welcome. Yvonne. We by the way, you? by the way, sorry, John. That took you three minutes and five seconds. That's what I thought of it, you know, all right? <laughs> there you go. Sorry, Yvonne. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, Thanks. Patrick, too. Yeah. Okay. Good morning again, everyone. Okay, so my story. The little girl tapped her feet impatiently. She couldn't wait for school to end. She was so excited. She couldn't wait to get home because she knew her parents would be proud and her mother especially would be proud of her. See, she was five years old and she had written her first composition all by herself. She told her mother she didn't need any help and she had gotten A. So she knew her mom would be proud of her, her parents, but her mom especially. She dashed home, almost running the entire way home rushed into the kitchen where her mother was and handed her her paper. And her mother took it, read it. Then she said, well, let your good be better and your better be best. The little girl was crushed. Mm. She thought to herself, not why Mom, mama can't say very good, not even one time. Had she ever heard her mom say, very good. She always quoted that, which turns out to be a quote by Saint Jerome. Saint Jerome. She learned that later on. And so this would go on for years, on her teenage years, her school life. And she came to believe that she would never be good enough for her mother in terms of what she did. And later she felt that her mother wanted to be perfect. She held on to this view. And so when she went into the working world, she decided that she was going to give 110%. Yes, she got all the promotions and the accolades. And that little girl, of course, you recognize was me. And I held that view until a few years ago, I was in an informal coaching session and I was sharing this belief about needed to be perfect and what have you. And my coaching, my coach said, what if it were not true? What if that were not true? I said, what do you mean? I experienced it all my life and he waited for me to calm down. I like to say he waited for me to get over myself. And then he said, what if your mother saw your potential and she wanted to make sure that you lived up to your potential? Because I knew my mother loved me, even though she never said very good. Hmm. And that resonated. I started thinking back and all the things that my mother did for me when my father wanted me to get, you know, just do certain things. And my mother said, not her daughter. And she somehow they got me to one of the best high schools in Jamaica, two best high schools in Jamaica. And 
I realized from that how easy it is for us to embrace the limiting beliefs because of our own perceptions and our own interpretations of what happened in life. And so I am happy that I get an opportunity to work with people and help them to question the limiting beliefs that stop them from moving forward. Wow. Wow. I love that, Yvonne. I love that. Thank really, you, um, you know, you should make a video of what you just shared. Think about that. Okay, Peter. Well, I will. Uh, you know, I listen to you, so I will. I know, I know. But I mean, <laughs> oh, my little heart was jumping up and down there. It's good. <laughs> Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you very much indeed. Anna. Thank you. Lovely to see you. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, so I have uh, I, I couldn't choose all week what story to tell. I apparently have a lot of more stories than I thought. I had the opposite problems than what I thought I would have. Because <laughs> I have a really interesting one about uh, being escorted out of Gaza, Gaza by armed soldiers with Uzis uh, uh, towards, you know, a safer place. So that, that's a fun story for another time. So this, my story actually is to do with the poster behind me. This was made specifically for me, but by my friend. It's all the things I love. So, and I'll go, I can show it in more detail, but it's, it is a, 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 so it's a list of the things I love. So it has my mom, my husband, cheese, you know, I have my priorities <laughs> straight. Um, but the reason I wanted to show this today, and it's especially it's the end of the year for all, um, right? And it's been, a, I've been in quite a year. And I want to tell you about my breakdown in March. So in, in, in March, I completely fell apart. I was already on a slippery slope before the pandemic hit, but then I had a conflict with my family doctor that really triggered me and I have some PTSD going from several issues in my life. And I remember feeling that it was the most, not the best time to have a breakdown, you know, and was feeling very annoyed with myself. It's March, I'm supposed to be buckling down, buying all the Lysol, stocking all the food, looking for toilet paper, because here in Ontario, we had that little influx of everybody bought the toilet paper real quick, right? So I remember thinking, what an important time for me to have a breakdown. Forget making money. This is just not a good time to not be all together. Right? And I'm talk, talking about limiting beliefs, Yvonne, it's the things we tell ourselves, right? As business owners, we all have a lot of pre extra pressure on us, especially if we work with people for whom we are responsible. So colleagues, employees, collaborators, contractors, name it, all right? And we also have family, right? That especially us younger people, we take care of the elderly, right? So we have a lot of responsibilities in our lives, right? And then we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to not, if not be perfect, then at least functioning. So what happens when you stop being functioning or whatever it is, the reason, right? I did not know what to do at the time. So I knew enough to fire my family doctor and go look for another one. That's as much as I uh, figured because every time I was speaking with her, I got triggered more and more and more and I fell down the abyss more and more and more, you know? So having not known what to do, I realized something was very off about this breakdown. Because I had one a few years ago, this didn't feel quite as light as the other one. And even that one knocked me out for a whole year of work, out of a whole year of work. So I realized that I'm having the um, unhealthy thoughts about my mental well-being, about the state of my life, everything in my life, and what am I bringing to this world. And already having had training in um, a lot of mental health prevention, I already noticed those little red, little big red flags. So I wanted to share a few things about what I did to help me get back to functioning. And I would say I'm even doing quite well functioning right now. 
So first things first is that I stopped working with clients. I cannot serve when I can others when I can't even serve myself. So I went and figured out what I can do right now to mitigate the situation in the middle of a pandemic. So this is already April, you know. So uh, first thing that I did is I spoke with Peter. Peter is my, my coach. And so that connection really helped. So first thing I would recommend you, you do if you have, if you're struggling is look for connections even in your life. And I don't mean business connections to get you business. I mean, for life tethering connections, life affirming connections. There's resources that not only don't deplete you, but possibly even replenish you in a little bit at a time. You know, whether it's a sunny person with a good disposition, you know, whether it's somebody like Peter who can tell you, stop working now before it escalates even further. Don't push harder. Sometimes you need to step back. So look for those connections is the first thing that I would recommend you do if you're struggling. Second of all, if you can, look for a therapist. It really is sometimes a life on a death situation and we don't even know. I didn't know how far off I was until I started talking with, with a therapist weekly and I started realizing a whole lot of, <laughs> a whole lot about where I'm at and where I can be. So I regained hope within a few months where I was completely hopeless for in, back in March. So that's to look for a therapist, a third party professional in the mental health field that has no connection to you, to your family, to your business, nothing. It's a third person and look, try to look for somebody who you can really speak frankly with as much as possible from the get-go. So don't just settle for somebody who has the credentials. Talk with the people, give yourself the time to find somebody who's just right for you. And if need be, reach out to a crisis line. I did it twice. I was so rough a couple of times that I had to call a crisis line. I, I, one thing I learned about life is pride is one of the things that kills us. I had to get over that moment of pride, especially given that leadership and emotional intelligence is my bread and butter, right? And so I couldn't re very well be telling others about it and not do it for myself, right? And then something else that helps, in my opinion, is art. And it's not necessarily making art. In March, I, you could not sit me down for two minutes to do any you know, color by number, whatever it's called, right? So sometimes it's not about making something. Sometimes it's about just looking and appreciating something as much as you can. So first thing I did is I created a little list of things I love in life. Not all of them are uh, right, very serious. As I said, there's cheesecake and potatoes on it, but there's also my mom and my nephew on it, right? And my sister. So it's just things that remind me what I like about love, what matters to me in life, even just a little bit. So I have a graphic designer who did this for me. I didn't just uh, do it. I did ask uh, the graphic designer to cast to customize something for me. I chose the colors, I chose the styles, all of those things. So this poster is all me. There's nothing about it that's generic at all. It's not you know very beautiful. It doesn't have uh, platitudes by any means. It's literally a list of things I love. I also bought several art pieces. And, you know, not expensive ones, but just something for me to look at. You know, something for me to appreciate that speaks to me. So, and that's the third thing. Art is therapeutic. Even if it's, you're not making it, even if it's not visual art, whether you're reading it, when, whether you're writing it. I, I wrote poems when I could. Not very good ones. I can't say that I'm particularly gifted in that area, but I enjoy it. So I don't deny myself the, the pleasure of writing them. Even though I don't show them to many people unless it, you know, it's something not, not the best that I created for them with love, right? So those are three things I thought would be a good start. And I know it's an actual story story, but it is a story of how Anna got better and how Anna stayed in this world. Then I wanted to show you. So that's it. Well, I do think I took more than five minutes then. Sorry. Well, I, I just appreciate people 
sharing such personal things. I mean, this is very special for me. Thank you very much, Anna, and John and, and Yvonne so far. I mean, I've really appreciated that. The fact that you are prepared to be vulnerable like this speaks volumes for you as a person. Well thank done. you, and thank you for your support. Can I, I've got one question for you, Anna. All right. Is throwing knives therapeutic? It is therapeutic, but you need to go to a range in Canada. You, apparently, you can just throw them at trees in the middle of the road. I have, to ask you. I have to ask you. <laughs> so, yes, it would be therapeutic <laughs> if I could, but you're in a pandemic, Peter. You don't I mean, go to like <laughs> throwing ranges. I'm going to make sure I'm on your very best side before I walk in your front door. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. I'm, I'm very fluffy and friendly. Everybody does. Okay. Sandy? You're next up, my man. Tell okay. a story that shares something that you really care about or really about. Okay, better. well, I think the fact is uh, definitely care about myself. So, but uh, the way you want to think of this story is it can be sad or it can be happy. And that's a matter of you making that decision. But here's how it starts is basically there's a couple things you need to know is that uh, there was 14 in my family, never lived with any of them at any time. Uh, I guess the thing is, is I didn't even know I had a family until I was five years old. So let me give you a little bit of background here is the, like when I was born, I was born in 1943. And uh, right at that stage, I all had 12, there was 12 in my family at that stage, eight brothers, four sisters. And, uh, and then in 1945, my youngest sister was born. And that was right after the, the war, Second World War. And then in 1947, my life begins. And that means I'm four years old. And what it, how it starts is that my mother is in a mental hospital for eight years. Hmm. So when this happens, what happens is the first thing that happens, the second, third, fourth daughters are all placed in a home. Like a, it's, a, it's a girl's home. Uh, the two younger brothers, which is me and my brother, Lori, we were placed in the Protestant orphanage the Halifax Protestant Orphanage. And, but I never made it to the orphanage. Uh, my brother spent his whole life there, but I was a foster child. So let me just go from there. So it's 1947, mm -hmm. I'm four years old. And the first thing that happens, my first foster parents were relatives, but they couldn't keep me. They couldn't, you know, uh, they had some family problems or money problems. The second foster people were uh, really cruel to me. They used to lock me up in the bathroom. They go outside and rake a rake and they had me scared to death. I was, Satan was everywhere. Uh, so that was, uh, you know, a, a real tough part. You gotta remember, I'm four years old. Uh, the, so then what happens is suddenly a car drives up and I find that I'm going somewhere, don't know where I'm going, but actually I'm going to my uh, third foster mother. And her name was Mrs. Morris. She was a Newfoundland lady. She had five daughters, which is really important because you'll hear me say sometimes I've had at least seven foster mothers. Well, those daughters became my mothers at some point. I lived with every one of them kind of thing. Uh, but I guess the thing is, is just a quick thing to engrave. When I was five years old, my dad found me. And he found me because there was a picture in the newspaper of kids that were going to school. And I was walking home from school and this taxi driver drives up, rolls down the window and says, do you know Allison Murray? And I said, yes, I'm Allison Murray. And I ran home because Mrs. Moore said, if any strangers ever stop you, make sure you run home. Anyway, I think the thing was, that was the first time 
five years old that my dad came to visit me. I guess I saw my dad maybe, I'm going to say 10 times in my life, but in essence, I probably only saw him. I might have been only eight that he ever visited me. But one time he says, you know, you have brothers and sisters. <laughs> and then he started talking about, he didn't talk about the numbers and he didn't talk about my mother being in a mental home. Anyway, I guess the thing is, is that uh, when I was 12 years old, I, uh, my mother actually passed away. But you got to remember, a mother to me, I did not know about a mother. I never used the word mother, right? I only found, found out like, uh, I, I kind of thought I was just came out from under a rock. <laughs> if that makes sense to you. Anyway, is uh, in 1955, my, my mother died. And the only time I saw her was when she was in her coffin. And that was a very dramatic experience. And the only reason they took me there, because they wanted to see if I could meet some of my brothers and sisters. Anyway, I just thought I'd share that with you. It's, it's uh, sad to some, but let me tell you, it's happy to me because I was able to battle the storms, had a great foster mother, had lots of great foster mothers, and I made a choice to come out on the, uh, the right side of the fence, and I'm a happy guy, so I'm not unhappy. So I hope you don't think of it as such a sad story, but I thought I'd share that with you. Hope you enjoyed it. Wow. Andy, I'm in so impressed with you. I mean, you're 77 years of age, and I love having you around because I'm not the oldest anymore, right? <laughs> yes. Okay? But yes. you have an incredible ability to overcome some of the most challenging things in life. And every time I've come in contact with you, you've always got a ready smile. And that is so, I mean, that's a compliment to you, my man. I mean, I admire you. You're inspirational. Yeah, it's, uh, I hope you got the book because I took you up, uh, like I actually ended up going back to the orphanage uh, when I was uh, 10 years old, yeah, 1953. If you got that book and you yes. start reading from then on, you get a little uh, perspective of what it was like to live in the orphanage. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. So Thank it you probably much. makes more sense to you now, Peter. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the rest of you, I hope you enjoyed it. A bit emotional, Sandy, actually. Be quite <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> well, you said the last time you said it can be emotional. Yeah. So I thought I would share that. Thank you very much, Sandy. Okay. Penny, nice to see you. And then after Penny, Patrick, and then I'll read you a little story I've got to finish with. So Penny, I'm looking forward to hearing your story that shares something that you value highly. Oh, I value a lot. It's hard to pick one. Um, I will share with you though, um, an experience that I actually went through myself three times over that it's the lesson I learned from it was that it's okay to say no. So if your plate is full and you're doing for everybody and you're working hard and you're trying to achieve these goals, if you can't, if it's too much on your plate, it's okay to say no to your friends or to other people that you, you want to help, your intentions are good. But like Anna said, if you don't take care of yourself, you're no good to anybody. And that being said, um, so it took me attempting suicide to realize that that's okay. Mm. And as well as your health. So it's physical and mental. So here I thought I was taking good care of myself. I was being healthy. I was working out. I was helping everybody. I was just doing me. And then I had a 10% chance of making it off an operating table. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> so I guess it's a life lesson that sometimes you don't know necessarily 
as much as you think you're doing for others, you also have to do for you. And looking back at that, I realized how much I would have missed out on. My kids graduating, their weddings, their the family, just things like that, right? Like important things to me now. So now I've learned if I'm busy or I can't handle anything more on my plate, I can see the signs where I start to get overwhelmed. And I just say, I will get back to you or I'd love to help you, but right now I can't. Mm -hmm. Or give me a day or two or whatever it may take. And lots of people that I've been around, I've noticed they don't do that. So I try to give them, if I need their assistance in something, I try to give them the out of saying, it's okay, take your time. Or if you're overwhelmed, it's okay to say no, I can ask somebody else. So that's just kind of a big life lesson for me. I also watched my dad do the same thing. Always busy helping every farmer out there. Then all of a sudden he got sick and nobody was there to help him. End result, he passed away from cancer, but he battled hard because he felt that he only had him. Mm. So it's just take care of your own self. Mm. Thank you, Pam. Wow, what a strong message. What a message. So true. By the way, if you ever want to reach out, Uncle Pete is here, okay? I'm a good listener. You haven't got to talk business. I'm happy to listen, okay? Good. So thank you very much, Penny. You shared from your heart, as you always do. Yeah, no. You want tissue? <laughs> Get waiting. One thing I learned. Hard. Sorry. You it. Patrick, my man, last <laughs> week you told a story that really stirred the emotions. I'm not sure whether you get what you're going to do this week. So over to you, my man. A story that shares something that you really value. Something that I really value mm -hmm. is uh, family. That's probably the utmost thing I value. Um, let's rewind. Rewind back to 1953. I was born into a... Sorry, I only had seven in my family, uh, Sandy. Yeah, dropped down seven. <laughs> I was the uh, second to the youngest. There was uh, Jordana, Mike, Ed, Bill, Tony, David. I was, I'm between Tony and David. And we grew, basically, we grew up in a normal family. You know, three bedrooms, one bathroom. That was it. Me, Tony, and David shared one room together where Bill and Ed had the other two rooms. And the uh, other room downstairs, my mom turned into a sewing room after my brother went into Marine Corps, after my sister uh, took off, went down to uh, South Carolina, got married. And for my sister, Jordana, Mike, and Ed, they were between 19 to 20 years older than I was, you know, so they were, anyway, and as today, let's go forward now, I am the last of my generation. Jordana passed away of cancer. Mike passed away of cancer and heart disease. Bill died of liver cancer because he was a heroin addict. David passed away liver cancer, never smoked, never drank, weird. Tony just passed away this year, first of the year. And my brother, Ed, just passed away last month of cancer. So flip a coin, cancer heart, either way. Aunts and uncles, same, same. But me, hell, I'm gonna live till I was 95 years old, just like my grandfather did. I'm stubborn as hell. I, uh, so family means value my, yeah, I miss my brothers. Hell, we fought like hell. Me and my little brother, David, we used to fight in the kitchen. Who was going to wash the dishes? Who was going to dry the dishes? It was a knockout, drag out fight. I know we, 
boom, boom. And mother would walk in, looked at us and grab both of them and go, bing, hit us together. You washed, you dry. Mom walked out. Me and David started all over again. So finally we settled our differences. So, uh, you know, I fought, us brothers, we fought. We, you know, we had knocked out, drag out fights, but we all loved each other to a certain extent. So, you know, and uh, yeah, family means a lot. Even my nieces and nephews, uh, you know, I'm the last uncle. It's weird. It's, uh, but it's okay. It's okay. You know, I, uh, I, I love to give a lot of value. My father and my mother at a young age, hell, we were in the berry fields picking at two, three years old, picking raspberries, strawberries, pole beans, bush beans, up the apple trees, up the cherry trees. We were small. We, we learned how to climb and we worked our asses off all my life. That's the way my dad raised us, work hard. But that was great. On the other hand, my dad taught all the other boys how to work on cars. Me, hell, I was up the, I was up the street playing with the neighbor girls. I, I didn't care about putting my head underneath of a car. I went out and played. That's, you know, I, that's what I still do today. I still go play. So that's it for me. Just want to, I got a lot of them just like you, Anna, and uh, ups and downs, but all, most of mine is uplifting. Then there have been some scary, some scary times, but never, never, I put myself down. You can never, ever put yourself down in the dirt, in the ditch, because then you got to work your way back up. Always keep a positive attitude in life. Always keep the faith. It's a, because it's a beautiful thing in life. Life is beautiful, man. You just got to grasp it, hold it, and make it yours. That's it. Thank you, uh -huh. Peter. Patrick, I love you. What a man you are. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, <clears throat> okay. Do you mind? I'm going to read you a story. I, I mean, like, man, you know me. I could tell stories all day and night, but I want to read this one to you. Right? It's not mine, as I said earlier. This was given to me many, many years ago. I don't know where, who created the story, but to put it in context for you, it was about tw maybe 15 years ago now, maybe a bit more. And deep inside me, I was holding myself to blame for something that really I should not have been doing. Okay. Um, and it actually started to build into something like resentment, to be quite frank. Okay. And I just couldn't move on. And I didn't, and I didn't realize that it was there until I came across this story. And the story hit me right between the eyes. And with your permission, may I read it to you? Because I think you might enjoy it. All right. And it's a little bit like yours, Yvonne. It's about a school teacher. Okay. A little boy, not a little girl. This is about um, an elementary or a junior or a primary school teacher by the name of Mrs. Thompson. All right. On the first day of the school year, she stood in front of the class and she told them a lie. Like most teachers, she told them that she loved them all the same. But really, that was impossible because there, right in the front row, slumped in his seat, was a little boy by the name of Teddy Stoddard. Mrs. Thompson had noticed he didn't play very well with the other kids that his clothes were always messy, that he smelled, that he constantly needed a bath. He could also be very unpleasant and, he, and it got to the point where Mrs. Thompson would actually take delight in marking his homework with a broad red pen, marking bold X's everywhere and putting a big F for failure at the top of his homework. At the school, she was required to review each child's past records, but she put Teddy's off until last. However, when she reviewed his file, she was in for a huge surprise. You see, Teddy's first grade teacher wrote this. Teddy's a bright child with a ready laugh. He does his work neatly and he has good manners. He's a joy to be around. 
Teddy's second grade teacher said this, Teddy's an excellent student, well liked by his classmates, but he's troubled because his mother has a terminal illness and life at home must be a real struggle for him and the family. His third grade teacher wrote this, his mother's death has been hard on Teddy. He tries to do his best, but his father doesn't show any interest in him whatsoever and his home life will soon affect him if steps aren't taken to protect him. Teddy's fourth grade teacher wrote this, Teddy's withdrawn and doesn't show much interest in school at all. He doesn't have many friends and sometimes he even sleeps in class. By now, Mrs. Thompson realized the problem and she was ashamed of herself. She felt even worse when her students bought her Christmas presents wrapped up in beautiful paper with bright ribbons about it, okay? except for Teddy's. His present was clumsily wrapped in heavy brown paper he got from a grocery bag. But Mrs. Thompson took pains to open it in the middle of receiving all the other presents. Some of the children actually began to laugh when she found a rhinestone bracelet with some of the stones missing and a bottle that was only one quarter full of perfume. But she stifled the laughter when she exclaimed how pretty the bracelet was whilst putting it on and dabbing some of the perfume on her wrist. Teddy Stoddard stayed after school that day just long enough to say to, Mrs. to her, Mrs. Thompson, you smelt just like my mum did. After all the children left, she cried for at least an hour. On that very day, she stopped teaching reading, writing and arithmetic and instead she began to teach children. Mrs. Thompson paid particular attention to Teddy and she worked with him and his mind seemed to come alive. The more she encouraged him, the faster he responded. By the end of the year, Teddy had become one of the smartest children in the class and despite her lie, became one of her teacher's pets. A year later, she found a note under the door from Teddy telling her she was still the best teacher he'd ever had in his whole life. Six years later, she got another note from Teddy. He wrote, he just finished high school, third in his class, and she was still the best teacher he'd ever had in his whole life. Four years passed, and then she got another letter saying that whilst things had been tough at times, he'd stayed in school and stuck with it and would soon graduate from college with the highest of honours. He assured Mrs. Thompson that she was still the best and the most favourite teacher he'd ever had in his whole life. Then four more years passed and another letter came. <clears throat> this time he explained that after he got his bachelor's degree, he decided to go a little further. The letter explained that he was now, that she was still the best and favourite teacher he'd ever had but now his name was a little bit longer and the letter was signed, not Teddy, but Theodore F. Stoddard, MD. But the story doesn't end there. You see, there was another letter that spring. Teddy said he'd met this girl and was going to be married. He explained that his father had died a couple of years ago and he was wondering if Mrs. Thompson might agree to sit in the place of the, the wedding that was usually reserved for the mother of the groom. Of course, Mrs. Thompson did. And guess what? She wore that bracelet, the one with the several rhinestones that were missing, and she made absolutely sure she was wearing some of the perfume that Teddy remembered his mother wearing on their last Christmas together. They hugged each other, and Dr. Stoddard whispered in Mrs. Thompson's ear, thank you so much for making me feel important and showing me that I could make a real difference in the world. Mrs. Thompson whispered back in it with tears in her eyes. Teddy, you've got it all wrong. You were the one who taught me that I could make a difference. I didn't know how to teach until I met you. Isn't that a beautiful story? Okay. And the message is this. It symbolizes never hold any resentments. You've got to move on in life. Yeah. And I, I just thought I'd like to share that with you because it made a huge impact on my life when I first heard it. Okay. Good story.
Thank you, everybody. Thank you for sharing. I hope I hope you enjoyed each other's stories. And the yeah. purpose of the exercise was for us to share from our heart, which which I congratulate you all. You did. And I'm hoping people who watch this learn to appreciate each and every one of you just that much more because you deserve it. All right. Talk to you next Friday. Yeah? Thank you, Peter, Bye. everybody. Thank you, Bye. Peter. Thank you. Everyone, have a good day, good weekend. Bye now. You yep. too. Oh, Bye. Oh, 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 o